Thank you, Mike. And now the big kickoff. We're going to have Ron Haynes introduce residents. Uh, Ron Haynes has not only uh, been a board member for the last year, but he was also on the Strategic Planning Committee for uh, board. So, Ron. Thank you, Ed. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize John Warren, who started the Strategic Planning Committee some time ago. John, are you here? Sorry. Would you stand up, please? Thank you. And could I ask the other members of the Strategic Planning Committee to stand up as well, so folks will know who, who was part of this. Well, I'm going to, uh, if you'll uh, forgive me, I'm going to read this because I, I really want to be proficient and efficient with my words. So uh, we met as a committee a half a dozen times and determined that we needed expert third party help given the gravity of the task of developing a comprehensive strategic plan that not only would encompass our amenities, but our ongoing relationship with the club our web presence and how we would cost effectively promote Cordier to the outside world. We then selected a smaller committee within the strategic planning committee to vet possible consulting firms. Given the guidance of the smaller committee, we selected residents and recommended them to the CMB and CPOA who unanimously approved it. Residents is a world renowned consulting group that consults with communities like ours, high-end resorts and hotels around the world. If you wanted more information about them, I would suggest visiting their website. Residence has now been on the job about a year, as Ed said. Before I turn it over, I'd like to request that there be no questions or comments made during the presentation. This is in the interest of time, as the presentation most likely is gonna last an hour or so. I will also tell you that we're putting together another survey. This survey will be to solicit your input regarding the ideas expressed in this presentation that residents will be sharing with us today. For those that are not here, the presentation and survey will be online later. The point is we want your input. Lastly, I would ask you to see this presentation as just another step in the process of understanding our community and that we are simply sharing with you all the information that has been developed by this outside consulting group. This is our way of bringing you up to speed with the process and explaining some options of how we might move forward in the future. Certainly there are all kinds of issues that would have to be worked out regarding any strategic plan, most notably timing and financing. So if you hear only one thing from me, please hear this. We are not proposing to do anything without community buy-in. And we are a long way away from that stage of the game. So without any further ado, <laughs> let me introduce Chris Fair to you, who has led this charge and is president of Resonance. And uh, we'll take it from here. Thanks, Ron. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Fair, president of Resonance, uh, based in uh, Vancouver, uh, which is a beautiful place to live, but uh, walking around here today is pretty equally beautiful, and I'm tempted just to walk away and go for a hike as I walk around. But- um, It's for homeowners only. <laughs> yes, I guess so, there you go. But I thought it'd be much more fun to share 100 slides in PowerPoint with you today. Hey, All right. Chris, just real quick, we'll let another five minutes left to vote. Just let another five minutes left to vote. Okay, the five, five minutes left to vote at lunch. Yeah. Also know that uh, 2.15, the voting closes. Um, so today I'm gonna to walk you through, we're gonna spend about five minutes on each of these, five to 10 minutes in each of these sections, but just a brief overview of what this project um, is all about in terms of the objectives and the process. Um, you all participated, or many of you would have participated a year ago in an owner survey, and that was really one of the first foundational pieces. And I'm just gonna pull two slides of that, of what we learned out of the responses and your input into that. Um, also, then we'll talk a little bit about the stakeholder interviews. I met with more than 50 different stakeholders, whether they be owners, builders, brokers, um, through through this process. Also, share with you just a couple highlights around consumer research. You know, our firm works in luxury resort development communities 
all over North America. We do extensive research on affluent travelers and vacation home buyers. I'm just going to share with you a couple of slides around what we see in the marketplace today and who are the vacation buyers, vacation home buyers uh, today in second home communities. Um, then we have Mike Budd from uh, Berkshire Hathaway is going to give you an update and share some of the latest data of what's happening here specific to the real estate market in terms of sales and values. We'll go through that. And then I'm going to go back in and talk about some community benchmarking. And what we wanted to do was not just look at the data of what's happening in this part of the country, but also we benchmarked and looked at four other communities, uh, one of them here and, and three other mountain golf resort communities that shared some similar characteristics to Cordillera. And I'll share with you some of our takeaways uh, from that. And none of that, based on all of this research and the conversations that have happened to date, uh, our SWOT analysis in terms of the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats from our perspective as consultants um, that we think need to be prioritized. We shared all of that and with the, uh, with the Strategic Planning Committee and the board a couple of months ago and identified some strategic priorities. And I'll share with you all of those items that were considered and, and what was prioritized. And from that, we've then developed three potential scenarios to consider. Uh, that will walk through some of the development options that we see uh, as a consultant. And then we'll wrap up in terms of some of our key conclusions and have an uh, opportunity here for discussion and, and Q&A at the end. So first off, just displaying the process here, you know, as I mentioned, owner survey was completed before we were engaged in this process, but it was very thorough, comprehensive. 66% of owners in the community, or 66% of households participated in that survey. Um, and that gave us some insight into, A, what is the makeup of the community today? What are some of the things that you're most satisfied with? What are some areas that need to be improved? And there was also a range of options that were presented in that survey for, for consideration. And I'll just share some of the highlights on that. As I mentioned, I did more than 50 stakeholder interviews. It's the next part of the process for us. And then I'll give you some of the highlights out of that. Uh, the community benchmarking followed the visioning workshop with the committee. And really where we are today is in that draft recommendations stage. Where we're now taking all of this input, sharing it to get with you for feedback. We'll be going out with a survey after this, uh, with this presentation to a broader audience. And based on that input, then we'll begin to develop the strategic plan and be put, putting numbers uh, to all of the strategies that are that are identified. So, real briefly, just in terms of that owner survey and, and what we learned from that about this particular community, as I mentioned, there were 475 households participated in it, 630 individuals. And that represented about 66%, two thirds of the community, um, which is you know, based on our experience working in other communities, destinations is an excellent level of, uh, of participation. Um, from that, we learned that the majority of respondents, that people that participated in, in the survey, have uh, owned property in Cordillera for more than, more than 10 years. Um, the majority are also part-time residents. It's basically around 20, 24% that uh, live here full time and, and the rest are seasonal or part-time part-time residents. Uh, the majority of you don't have children living at home any longer. Um, and we saw just in terms of demographics that 76% of Cordillera homeowners based on the people that participated in the survey are between the ages of 55 and 74. And you can also look at that, slice it even further down that we saw that basically half of this community is age 65 plus. So that's just some of the demographics that came out of the owner survey. Um, this is going to be really difficult for you to see. Um, so I'll explain what's in this chart. And again, this whole deck will be available um, to everybody at the uh, end of this presentation. But this was, you may have seen this before, it was in the community research, but it's one particular piece where you were asked to rate both the importance of various amenities within the community, which is along the horizontal axis, and the satisfaction level with those particular amenities and services. So those items that are up in the top right quadrant are the things that you uh, rated to be the most important and you were also the most satisfied. And one of the great takeaways out of this piece is there's actually nothing in the bottom right quadrant, quadrant here. There's nothing that owners said that they were was really important to them that you were dissatisfied or had negative satisfaction levels. So just to highlight some of the things that are in the top right, Actually, the thing that you view to be the most important and you're most satisfied with is snow plowing. Uh, <laughs> right behind that and the left is the uh, post office, uh, public safety, open space and trails, um, healthy forest and, and wildlife and administration services. So you kind of have that cluster in the top right uh, of those things that you rated and said were most important to you as owners um, that you were also most satisfied with. Then you kind of look just below that, there's a other cluster of things that are also quite important. 
but didn't quite get the same level of satisfaction. And that was Athletic Center, Communications, uh, Design Review Board, Community Enrichment, Trailhead, uh, short course fly fishing. So those things are also quite important um, and you're not negatively satisfied with them, but you're not as satisfied with them as those in the, in the top right. And then you can kind of see this other cluster here of things that rated around a three to 3.5 in terms of importance and satisfaction, car wash, quarry camp, dog park, equestrian center, cafe, ice rink, uh, et cetera. So the takeaway for us out of this is really focusing in on what's most important to you as a community. As I said, the good news out of this was there was nothing identified right out of the gate that said, you know, this is, there's a major issue here, that this is something that the community is telling us is really important to them as owners that they're negatively satisfied with. So what we have here are some really key strengths. And then we have a few other areas here. What, what I really look at are those things like athletic center, communications, community enrichment, design review board, trailhead as things that there's room for improvement. There's something there that we want to figure out how do we raise those up in terms of level of satisfaction. Um, this chart you also won't be able to see, but uh, one of the key takeaways here was you were asked about your level of support for a variety of potential um, improvements or modifications to, to Cordillera. And basically a 3.0 or higher are those things in aggregate that you're in favor, uh, in favor of as a community. And there were actually only three things on this whole list that in aggregate as a community that you were in favor of. And that was marketing the Cordillera community, charging fees for equestrian lessons and clinics, and marketing Cordillera real estate. And just behind that, just all, at 2.98, was providing a shuttle service during the ski season and expanding healthy forest and wildlife mitigation. And then you have all of these other things here like expand and remodel trailhead pool at 2.52, uh, things like provide a year-round dog port to 2.3, um, build a centrally located community center was at uh, 1.96. So one of the takeaways out of this is not so much to drill down into the individual items, but you know, for us was looking at going that there are a lot of different opinions with respect to all of these different things that are being discussed. And one of our challenges, great challenges with this project is going to be to build consensus around what exactly should we do uh, moving forward. I think also that a lot of this, you were asked this question from our perspective without a lot of context. You know, these were thrown at you without necessarily a strategic plan. And I think that really speaks to the need and the opportunity with this particular project is to help build a case around what is happening at Cordillera today. What do we want to happen in the future? How do we get there? And then we can evaluate what we should be doing in terms of particular items for modifications or changes within the community. So from that was done, as I said, as we came into the project, it was a great foundational piece of research. It's something that we would have normally done if it hadn't been done already. Um, so that got us off to a bit of a head start. And the next piece then was around stakeholder interviews. As I mentioned, I met with uh, between 50 and 60 different individuals. We really looked at a, a cross section of everyone from board members to part-time owners to full-time owners. And then more importantly, because we'd already done the survey, we had a lot of those insights, was actually engaging external stakeholders. And we talked to brokers, we talked to builders, we talked to architects, uh, we talked to people from the county, we talked to people from you know, the town of Vail. Um, of getting what do they see as some of the key issues and opportunities from an external perspective um, as it relates to Cordillera. So these are in no particular order, but just some of what we heard in summarizing um, those conversations. Uh, the, well, some of the key strengths that came across out of all of those interviews with there's really a strong owner and community pride amongst uh, all of the owners, or by and large, all the owners that we, that we talked with with respect to Cordillera. One of the feedback and recurring themes around what you see as the key strengths of Cordillera, the open space and trails, views, natural environment. Uh, you're really living in a one-of-a-kind environment that uh, like, unlikely to be replicated in a community forum and, and any time in our lifetime anyway. Um, also, the best-in-class golf experience. Um, for some people, the highlighted the unique access uh, to private fly fishing, uh, which a lot of other communities don't have. Uh, as we saw in the owner survey, maintenance of roads, everyone's satisfied with, um, and you all really love your post office. That came up <laughs> over and over and over and over. All right. So talking about just some of the issues, that's the good news. Uh, and again, these are in no particular order, but these are things that we heard out of the conversations. Uh, with respect to the future sustainability and vibrancy of the community. Uh, people talked about, concerned about home values, they talked about attracting younger buyers, uh, improving communications uh, amongst owners in the community. Uh, a lot of people talked about the need to invest in current amenities, 
Um, for people within the divide, we heard about you know distance to indoor built amenities uh, you know, was a concern for them. A um, few people, actually this was more external uh, stakeholders talked about concerns around housing development along Highway 6. Um, you're all experiencing the construction that's going on right now. Um, you know, as more development happens there, how does that create, does that create any potential issues, congestion for accessing Cordier from Highway 6? Um, some people talked about uh, the lack of rental product with the loss of the lodge. Uh, both in terms of as a marketing tool and introducing prospective owners to Cordillera. Um, Short-term rentals was an issue that came up sometimes with respect to policy and regulations around uh, the rental of homes on a short-term basis through platforms like VRBO or, or Airbnb. A lot of people talked about the lack of marketing and the need to market Cordillera. Um, design guidelines is something that came up a little bit, you know, looking at the design guidelines um, that were created more than 20 years ago. Uh, how do we modify or update those? Uh, labor is a concern for some people, you know, just thinking about acquiring, you know, staff, and this is not a unique Cordier issue. Um, that's an issue for everyone in the hospitality or club business today or across the country. Um, and of course, taxes is an issue um, on every list and every project that we do, people complain about taxes. So that's on the list as well. Um, in terms of opportunities, um, and again, no particular order, um, but some people talked about, you know, the ability to attract more Denver families. Um, Denver hasn't historically been a strong market here. Uh, most of those people have gone to the front range, but 20 years later, people's lifestyle have changed. Uh, people are with technology able to maybe work from a distance. If people ask, is there an opportunity to maybe go after that market in a way that we haven't before? Um, people talked about creating more biking trails. You know, cycling has risen in popularity um, as a sport and activity for all demographics. How do we capitalize on that? We have great trails already. How do we enhance and leverage that? Um, as we saw in the owner survey, people largely in favor of a ski shuttle on weekends, uh, a need to create a community event space. I think that's something that we've heard uh, time and time again of you know, one of the things that Scordier was developed in multiple phases in multiple communities. There was no large central gathering area. Um, also looking at uh, some people talked about creating staff housing as a way to attract and be competitive for labor. Um, other people talked about, we talk a, kind of a lot about how the Vale Valley perceives Cordillera, um, and one of their ideas was that we should be getting more involved and participating in various Vale Valley events um, as a way of uh, enhancing exposure and awareness for Cordillera. Um, and some people also talked about creating a better sense of arrival and weight binding. So that was kind of just a long, a long laundry list of, of where we started with based on those kind of two inputs of what we learned from the owner survey and then from these stakeholder interviews. And then, you know, our next challenge is trying to say and filter well, which of those things and which of those issues, opportunities are really critical and important to the future of Cordillera. I wanted to kind of just highlight from a macro level, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about consumer research and then uh, Mike is going to talk about sort of what's happening here in this particular market. Uh, we do a lot of our own research amongst affluent households, the wealthiest 5% of households and travelers in the United States and the wealthiest 1% trying to understand what their aspirations are in terms of where they want to travel, what kinds of hotels they're looking for, uh, what kinds of vacation homes they want to buy. Um, we also, this is literally two or three slides that are going to summarize all of that research. And I think one of the key takeaways that I wanted to share with you out of this was that, as we saw in the owner survey, that 76% of Cordillera's current homeowners are aged 55 plus. Um, as you look around the room, I can see that. And then um, when you look at who's actually buying based on RCL code, real estate advisors, they actually just did a survey earlier this year, and they did a survey of 55 plus households across the US that were looking to move in the next one to two years and asked them where were they considering moving to, and only 5.65% of them um, said to a resort area. Um, so that for us is a bit of a red flag of just saying that, or an indication that people that are going to move here next are not necessarily the same as the people that already live here today. Um, in our own study around vacation homeowners, that we found that just 14% of vacation homes, second homes, are owned by people that are 65 plus um, across the country today. And then we also, when we look at prospective buyers, uh, we found that only 5% of those households looking to purchase a vacation home in the next 12 to 24 months are age 65 plus. Um, so the key takeaway here is that, and we heard this through the conversation and the stakeholder engagement, that we expect that we need to attract that next generation of buyers. Um, and I think a lot of the data you know, backs that up. So who are the uh, vacation 
buyer, home buyers today. We spend a lot of time thinking about this as we have more than $2 billion of real estate in development in, in various projects. So we're thinking about who are we selling and marketing these homes to. Um, we found that 59% uh, of prospective vacation home buyers fall into a, what we call a particular psychographic. So rather than just thinking about the demographics and the cohorts, we actually try and look at behavior in terms of how travelers, what types of destinations they go to, what types of activities they participate in. And this segment called All In Enthusiasts represents about 24% of all households in the United States that travel. Uh, but when it comes to buying and considering a vacation home or a second home, they actually 59% of prospective buyers fall into this particular segment. And I like to characterize them as, and you probably all fall into many of you into this segment as well, and that you're very activity oriented, not so much around passive leisure, you're looking for active leisure. You're looking for hiking, you're looking for biking, you're looking for skiing, you're looking for golf, um, and you're looking for other enrichment experiences, opportunities to learn, et cetera. These are the most active of all of the, of all of the segments. And the key characteristics of this all-in enthusiast segment, when we look at the affluent ones that have household income of 250K plus and a minimum net worth of 2.2 million, so they fall into that wealthiest 5%, they're actually the youngest of all of the traveler segments. On average, they're 43 years old. 82% uh, of them are still working full time. 65% of them still have kids living at home, which is why you see their average household size is 3.5. Um, and 16% of them have income of over a million, um, and 44% have uh, net worth of over, over 8 million plus. So as we think about and putting together a strategic plan for Cordillera, you know, we're mindful to think about the input that you gave us or gave in your owner survey around what's important to you today, but we also want to be thinking about this next generation of buyers and who, who are they and what's important to them. Because there, some things may be the same and some things may be different. And it's important as we think about a long-term strategic plan that we're looking at five, 10 years from now, um, that we're not just thinking about the needs and what's of interest to you in this room, uh, but also for this next group that's going to come next. And one, so one slide, last slide on this consumer research of specifically drilling into this segment of current vacation home buyers. And we asked them what's important in choosing a community or a destination when you're considering purchasing a vacation home or, or a second home. And this is the list um, in order around those factors that are most important. Interestingly, sustainability, energy ratings comes up at the top. You know, based on our experience, we know that's not a key driver, um, but it's the kind of thing that everybody can agree with um, and checks that box as, as being important. Um, but beyond that, you look at these things and you see access to a swimming pool, access to walking trails, is within a private gated community, access to fitness facilities, access to spa facilities. Uh, for many homeowners, vacation homeowners, being in proximity to their primary residence is important. Um, availability of kids programs, featuring a community clubhouse, proximity to skiing, proximity to golf course, and there's other items below this below this list. So the, the good news is that for Cordillera as a community, you check a lot of these boxes today. Um, so that, you know, I think we're looking at times have changed, maybe golf is not as much of a driver, but for this particular segment, it still is an important driver. It's still uh, in the top 10 list here, uh, right, there, right there with skiing. But there are some other areas here as we think about um, where we are today and what our amenity offering is um, that we might need to consider uh, making some improvements in order to satisfy the needs of what these uh, current prospective buyers are looking for. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Budd from Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Mike's a broker. Um, you probably met with him in the past. He's collected extensive data throughout the Vale Valley, and he's going to give you a bit of the highlights around uh, what he sees happening here currently and also historically over, over time. Thank you. Thank you. One second here while I open up my cheat sheets. Yeah. I guess, let's see, let's start here. Yeah. There we go. This is kind of the basic graph that we always throw out. And it looks, huh, last three years, things are pretty stable when it's all said and done. Key points I just want to mention here is let's always look at that under $1 million price point and the number of transactions in that area. And then we get to really the market that Cordillera participates in, which is the one to two million, the two to five, and really not much in the five million category. So, but to understand that, 
we need to go to a little more detail. This is a breakdown and percentage share of the respective markets. If we look at that under 1 million, and there was a time when, if we go back to the oh, late 1990s and early 2000s, when many of the Enclave product, which are about 228 or 30 of, of total houses, were selling in that range. So we did used to participate in that, that category, not so much anymore, but you can see that category was at 75%, 73 down to 70. And then if you get down to the next one, which is just used in the six months and takes us over to uh, 2019, it's dropped down to 68%. That's not by choice, that's by absolute lack of inventory. For many years, the highest transactional market share in the, in the valley was half a million and down. And then half a million and to one million was the second largest. That is flip-flop lack of inventory in the half million down, which is driven in a lot of instances by cost of construction. And what it did is it moved up into the half million to million category as the least transaction area. And that really allowed the people who were financially capable at the upper end of the lower segment moved into the lower end of the upper segment, but it kept the total market relatively similar. Um, but then let's get into the, the really the market shares that Cordier really participates in, the one to two million and the two to five million. That's basically where the bulk of your business takes place. But what we need to understand, that only impacts 29% of the real estate market in this valley. So we've got a good share in that market, but that's all that we participate in. And that kind of goes back to basic economics 101, supply and demand, price elasticity, all of those things. And then when you get into marketing terminology, you get down to what's the unique selling proposition of an individual product. One of the issues that we have to address is that the bulk of the property was constructed pre-2003, effectively. So therefore, it was created in an environment that was driven, as the macro numbers talk about, baby boomers who bought and all of us embraced that product. Now we get to that next group of folks that are in their 40s and early 50s. As we just heard, they travel. They travel a lot. They're a lot more inured with that process than owning a space that they come to. It's a little different animal. And so that makes the whole proposition a little more creative as to what we need to do or not need to do in the process. But it's, you know, we're maintaining, even we're at 30% market share if we look at it in the first six months of this year. So it hasn't really changed much. It's staying in that range and what's going to be always be the driver is the number of units that the market offers so let's go this is one of those like the first one. Oh my goodness the per square foot sales prices of arrowhead single tree and courtier now I have to tell you that graph is not worth the paper it's written on, unless you look at the detail and understand how it's created. But so often that's what we get hung up talking about. The real facts are when you get this way, here's Singletree, which showed that it had a slightly higher per square foot selling price than Cordillera. Singletree, if we go back four years of full time and year to date through the 21st of August, that's what they do under a million. Then they go to one to two million, they've grown in that category, but it's still not huge until we got to this year. And it jumped to 15 transactions year to date versus last year, you know, 29, so we're already halfway there. But the real key is you go to the next two columns, they have four under contract, four and two in the different segments. 
but their inventory is three, nine, and three. And I left out, they have two listings over three million, first time ever. So they actually have 19 listings. But when you look at that relative to what they're selling, they have six months or less inventory, which they are a very stable market. Second part of that equation is supply and demand and the price elasticity thereof. They're driving price points up for lack of product in those key price points for those. We're now seeing duplexes in Singletree that are brand new, 2,000, 2,200 square feet, selling for a million two, a million three. Think of the impact that has on the per square foot selling price in Singletree. And that's one of the things we always have to look at. If you go down to the average per square foot sales, that's the second from the bottom. 2,680, 3,300, 2,700, 2,900, 3,000. Those numbers are almost 2,000 square feet below the same average transaction in Cordillera, which is going to impact your sales per square foot numbers. Doesn't mean that it may not be two and a half million dollars, but you know, when we get hung up comparing this, the actual, the actual average per square foot selling prices, 319, 320, 355, 375, 374, those all begin to correspond to that $1.2 million category growing. That's the driver for that for single tree. Arrowhead. This one really throws most of us. One million and under. They sell a significant number of condos in that segment. They currently have 400 contract and they have four in inventory. Well, they already sold eight in the first eight months. They're very low inventory to at best in that category for the balance of the year. <laughs> one to two, and one to two million, significant category for them. And that tends to be the bigger condos and the duplexes that exist in Arrowhead. And we see those sales. You see that really in 2019, they're only one shy of what they sold in all of 2018. And they have five under contract. So that's a segment that, again, has been a huge factor for them this year and continues to be. Now, you get down and you look at the per square foot average, 3,400 unit, 3,400 feet, 2,800 feet, 2,800 feet, 33, 3,200 feet. Again, only slightly larger than the single tree numbers because you have so many of the transactions that are in these smaller units and the price is inching up. And I will share with you when I get down to per square foot basis, 595, 556, 559, 621, 629. That was driven by one transaction. They sold a 9,000 square foot house for 9 million. So that had a thousand, a little over a thousand dollar per square foot selling price. So that's because our samples are so small one or two transactions can have huge impact and distort our perception of what's really going on. But again, only 39 in inventory, 13 under contract. They basically will have already achieved what they did last year. When you add that 13 to the 34 year, uh, 47, they're within one that they sold last year. But again, it's happening in a very specific segment. Okay, let's go to Cordillera. I thought y'all needed a little more depth on this one than I did on the others. This goes back to 2000 and brings us up to 821 of 2019. The under 1 million, as you can see, uh, back in the early 2000s, we had a fairly significant bump in there, and that was some new product coming on as we went through it, but it's trended pretty much the same. There's no inventory and there's nothing under contract. So there's not much likelihood of anything significant happening there. 
I broke it down into smaller pricing niches so you could get a better understanding of it. The one to 1.5 million category and look across there and you can see it's relatively stable for all intents and purposes, anywhere between eight and 12 over the time frame. Been five year to date. But there, there's one under contract and the inventory is only seven units. So effectively, it's right about what's considered to be a stable market inventory. And there should be some more products sold in that range. 1.5 to two. Again, we've got kind of that same trend. We had our, we had our great years back in 04, 05, 06, which was the blip we had valley wide. And you can see what that did. And we, again, the trend is pretty flat. We get back over, we had five sales in the first eight months, but we've got 18 in inventory. So, geez, I'm gonna put my house on the market or I have my house on the market. In that inventory, in that price point, I've got 17 competitors and there were only five sales in eight months. So we need to be realistic with our expectations and say, okay, how am I going to create a unique selling proposition for my property versus the other 17 properties? And the USP terms, an old marketing term, you know, how do I differentiate myself? If, if we're all in the same basic price, what makes me different? And that's a factor that we all need to think about when we're planning for it. Two to three million, you know, again, our, our volumes are relatively stable. As we go through it, we had eight sales in the, or nine sales in the first half, or first eight months. So we actually sold more than we did last year all year. We got one under contract, but we've got 32 in inventory. So we have to be realistic. Um, we sold nine in eight months, got 32 out there. So there's pressure and everybody needs to understand that pressure that exists and it gets back to that basic part of the whole process what's the price elasticity for a given product within the marketplace three to four much smaller segment um, we sold four i'm sorry we sold one got one under contract but we got 10 in inventory and then we go to the upper nothing really in the four to five and we've got one property under contract at uh, in the five million plus and one on the market so you then drop down and say okay units sold going back to 2000 and many of us have a perception that we were selling a lot more product in those early years 34 30 37 35 the bubble 51 dropped off to 37 65 45 and then we're right back in that same stable level for all the years thereafter. Average per square foot selling price, 348. Up in the peak, we dropped, jumped up to 427, 408, dropped right back down. Year to date, we're at 348. Average per square foot selling price. Average square foot units. Remember, everybody else was around 3,000. 4,600, 4,700, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. As you go across, you got an average of 4,829 square feet, which is going to drive the per square foot selling price down based upon these price categories. It's not anything you're doing. It's That's the real way the system works when you do it. And, you know, as you, as you kind of look at those kinds of things, you sort of say, well, how do I address that? Well, those are, those, those are tough animals to deal with because there's not a real simple animal. If you kind of, as I showed you the square, the market share of those on total market standpoint, if we look at uh, single trade as an example, it has a market. It has a market share of. Um, well, in it, it has about a thirty-one percent market share in that under million. 
dollar of the total market. If I go down and look at that arrowhead and whatnot, the over of the overall market, single tree represents four percent in the one to two. Um, arrowhead represents ten percent, and uh, up here we're talking thirteen percent. I'm sorry, in the, in the higher market share. So the net effect is you've got a significant market share in the category in which you operate. The fact is you just don't operate in the biggest category. So that's one of the issues that we deal with and really something to kind of always look at in the process because, uh, you yeah, know, it, uh, those are things that aren't, they aren't controllable. I mean, the product we have is the product we have. It's the size, it's the vintage, and what is the elasticity of pricing for that particular product? So uh, those are, uh, shall we say, overall looks, but I'll share a couple ones in particular with you that are always my favorite. If we were to go back to Here's the total market. If you look up there at 5 million plus, last year the market had 51 transactions. They represented 4% of the units in the whole value. They represented 32% of the dollars in the whole value. So if I then go to 2019, six months, there's 18 units in that market segment, which is only 2% of the market. So if I just take that decline, that represents $113 million in decline in that category alone. And the overall market is only down $69 million. So the market is up in dollars, slightly down in transactions, but because of those transactions, the market is down basically $75 million. So everything other than that has pulled it down. And that's one of the anomalies we deal with, which we have such a high percentage of, of dollars coming out of such a small percentage of transactions, which is not a typical real estate market, but it's the one we deal with. So. Uh, that, I believe, covers all my slides, but I, as I said to everybody this morning, um, I'm a senior citizen, so oftentimes I forget in the next half hour what I talked about last half hour. So if anybody has any questions, well, it's top of mind. I'd be happy to try and answer those. Uh, right now. Yeah. Any comment on the average age of inventory in these markets? Yeah. The average age of inventory in single tree and arrowhead is at or slightly older than in Cordier. However, there's been more new construction in single tree in particular. And when I say more, they, they've been sold out on lots for a long time. And they totally have about 1,050 homes. They've added about 10 or 12 homes in the last 12 months that are new. And they have sold like popcorn at a higher value than their predecessors did. So there's no question that when we're, when we're dealing with today's marketplace, newer product and frankly, smaller product are very appealing to the clientele. And the other thing you would differentiate, Arrowhead is even slightly less primary residence than Cordilleras. Singletree is double the primary residence of Cordillera. So you've got differing aspects. You have much more of a need in Singletree versus the want. Arrowhead, there's only about 100 and some, 100 to 200 people as a full-time resident. So it's, a, it's it, they're all different animals. But we address them in that fashion. Anybody else have a question? 
Mike, do you want to address the anomaly though that we had in Cordillera also being the uh, $15 million set? Won't that distort our numbers for this year? Uh, you mean the, the sale over the, over the, I, I didn't plug those into okay. these numbers okay. intentionally because I thought they would just mess up right. everybody looking at a trend. Oh, okay. anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, it was, as I always refer to it as the Thomas the Train House, um, I didn't throw that into the numbers because it would have skewed the numbers. They wouldn't have made any sense from the terms point, so I didn't throw it in. And that one transaction sat out there, remembering that it started at 30 million and ended up selling at 15 million. What are the average days in the market? All the way price point. It will all be determined by price point and inventory. So there's no such similar thing as an average. You bring a new product on in Arrowhead, price in certain price niches, it'll go quick. Uh, Cartier had an interesting dynamic uh, up on the summit. $3.2 million listing went under contract in 46 days, but it was built in 2017. So there's, there are factors that come to play. And just across the street from me in Singletree, there's a duplex with each side being, one side's 2,200 square foot, the other one's 2,000. The big side's selling for a million 395 and the small side's selling for a million one. It used to be you bought duplexes in single tree for seven hundred thousand. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it seems as if the valley is on fire in terms of the valley club versus up here. Is do you notice a difference? The valley club is a totally different animal. You're right. However, let's go back to supply and demand again. What we find is more full-time residents gravitate there. Very simple answer: proximity. And I'm willing, if I'm buying there, I want the proximity versus feeling that I-70 and the trailer park is my primary view. If I want serenity, views, et cetera, this is where you want to be. But you have to look at who's the buyer, and that tends to be more of a need buyer than a want buyer. We need to move along or we'll be here all day. <laughs> Nobody else has any questions? Thanks, Mike. Uh, so the last piece of research we wanted to share with you was then also looking at some other community benchmarking that we do. We looked at and identified other mountain communities that all had golf as a component proximity to skiing and wanted to look at what's happening in these other markets. Um, we overlap a little bit here and then we also did look at, at Arrowhead uh, with the data that, that Mike had. And then we looked at three others. We looked at Big Sky in Montana with Moonlight Basin. Um, in Lake Tahoe, we looked at Martis Camp, uh, which is actually in, in Truckee. And we looked in Park City at, at Promontory. All of these communities, I'll share just a few highlights of to bring up to speed. Arrowhead you're probably quite familiar with since it's right here. Um, Nicholas Golf Course, they have access to ski, ski and ski out clubhouse. And uh, you saw all of the data there that, uh, that Mike shared around uh, this community. So we won't spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, as we get outside the Vale Valley then, we looked at, you know, what are some of the best performing mountain resort communities? And Marta's Camp is uh, right near the top of the list. Um, this is a community we worked on several years ago. It's 2000 acres, uh, backs up onto North Star. In Lake Tahoe, it's just outside a small town called uh, uh, Truckee. There's 672 home sites. They've all been sold at this point in time, so the community has been completely sold by by the developer a few years ago. Um, has a major 50,000 square foot golf clubhouse and lodge. Has an interesting amenity. I'll show you pictures of a family barn. Has a Fazio golf course. Um, some other interesting amenities like a ski and ski out lodge on North Star. So none of the properties in this community are ski and ski out, um, but they're a short drive to their own clubhouse that has a lift um, to North Star. Um, and they have some other interesting things like the Oak School, and they also built a little beach club uh, on Lake Tahoe. Um, so this is the lodge um, sitting on the 18th hole, 50,000 square foot clubhouse, as I mentioned, has its own fitness, spa, swim. Um, this is probably the most interesting part of Mark's camp. Uh, uh, it's called the Family Barn. So this was a family-oriented amenity. Um, actually, this community was actually conceived to have two golf courses. Um, and had to give one up in the entitlement process. And we were looking at 15 years ago, what are we gonna do to replace the other golf course? 
and we developed the idea of creating a family-oriented amenity. So within this, they have a bowling alley, soda fountain, arts and crafts studio, gymnasium, swimming pool, uh, fitness center, all this ability to do public events, concerts, has a movie theater. So very family-centric amenity. Um, probably the first community to ever do this. This is back in uh, 2005 timeframe. Um, this is their ski and ski out lodge, uh, 8,000 square foot with dining, food and beverage inside. Um, they also created an interesting, this is their uh, lost library. So along the hiking trails, there's a small building that has a library in it that serves uh, coffee and snacks that you can go and hike to and just hang out. So that's, that's Marta's camp. Um, we're going to get to the numbers in a sec. Uh, Moonlight Basin is in Montana um, at Big Sky. It's an 8,000 acre project, really you know, backing up onto, uh, onto the ski slopes. They have a 30,000 square foot clubhouse, Jack Nicholas golf course. Um, there's a lake, more of a pond really, um, but they have outfitters and they do have a camp similar to like Camp Cordy uh, that they call Camp Moonlight. This just gives you what the perspective there looks like. Um, this is the clubhouse on the outside, clubhouse on the inside. Another shot of it here. Um, this is the pond uh, and the camp. Um, and the last one that we looked at was Promontory, which is outside of Park City, Utah. It's a 6,400-acre community. It has a Nicholas and a uh, Peak Dye golf course. Uh, has a 20,000-square-foot ranch clubhouse, which is separate from the golf clubhouses. So this is kind of swim, tennis, spa, uh, fitness. Um, they also uh, kind of knocked off the family barn idea and created what they call the shed, which is a 12,000-square-foot family-oriented amenity bowling alleys, has a little uh, restaurant within it, gymnasium. Um, they also have a man-made lake and a little beach house and pool. And they have a uh, 5,000 square foot kids cabin. And they also have an equestrian center, very similar to Cordillera's. Um, this is the ranch house uh, clubhouse. Um, this is the back of it here with the pool. Um, inside you have fitness. Um, this is the Nicholas clubhouse that was built in 2014. It's actually undergoing an expansion already. Uh, based on the number of homes that they sold. Um, this is inside the clubhouse, so it's a much more uh, contemporary feel. Um, this is that shed facility that we talked about, the family-oriented uh, amenity space. Um, has a great patio outside uh, with a great, great view. Um, this is inside, gives us an idea of what that looks like in terms of the bowling alleys, gym, and the, uh, the restaurant. Um, and this is the beach house uh, looking out, which is really a small facility, um, but has an infinity edge pool, and this large man-made pond that people take out stand-up paddle boards, um, et cetera. So that's kind of just to give you a bit of a quick, very quick visual reference, but what we were really interested in looking at that, of, so what are the homes here selling for in these different um, communities? So you can see we're looking here at median listing prices of uh, Mars Camp, your median price is uh, 5.6 million, uh, and they're selling at a median of about almost 1,200 square foot. So been probably one of the highest benchmark communities and this is the largest driven by the market is all Silicon Valley families, owners, uh, huge wealth creation there. And some of it is finding its way to Mars Camp. Um, and especially when you compare Mars Camp to everything around it in the North Lake Tahoe area, um, those homes are selling at 276% of what the median per square foot price is in that area. Um, here we have Arrowhead Village. You already saw, saw those numbers. Um, you know, we looked at and compared well, what Arrowhead is getting about 180% versus the median price. Uh, per square foot in this area. Uh, Moonlight Basin, um, interesting here, they're at 729 a square foot. Most of that is, all of these first three communities here um, have close proximity to skiing, uh, which you know, really drives some of those price points. And we did a whole separate analysis of looking at the premium of ski in, ski out, or ski access uh, versus non-ski access. Um, Promontory, um, it's interesting, it's at 528 a foot. Um, and they're capturing the median price even though that they're actually 20 to 30 minutes away from skiing. So in a proximity relationship to skiing, very, very similar to Cordillera. And then here we have Cordillera, you know, median listings are at 2.3. Um, and our median listing is 380 versus um, the mean averages, but similar. But one of the takeaways here is when we look at and say in this particular community, you're only getting 80% of the median area uh, price here uh, versus these other communities are capturing median area value or surpassing it. Um, so we wanted to look at and decide a little bit around, you know, why is that? And I think some of our takeaways is that obviously the closer any of these golf communities are to skiing, the higher values they're getting a premium over, over area prices. Um, also, you know, looking at that, we saw that Cordillera was the lowest performing amongst these benchmark communities. 
there can be a whole variety of factors that we can get into into, into why that is. But I think one of the takers we looked at and said, well, which of these communities is most similar uh, to Cordillera in terms of proximity to skiing and, pro and size, number of homes built, et cetera. And we saw a really strong parallel between Promontory um, and Cordillera, Promontory being the one in Park City. So we wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive into just benchmarking specifically around those two communities. So we looked at, interestingly, you have almost about the exact same number of homes. There's 581 homes have been completed in Promontory, 585 in Cordillera. Um, Promontory was started uh, about 12 years later than, than Cordillera. So it is a younger, a younger community. Um, did not have uh, necessarily had a similar story in terms of this project also went bankrupt at one point in time. Um, it was recaptured by the original developer that was able to write off a significant amount of debt, which gave them a competitive advantage to revalue and reprice all of their uh, real estate and also infuse and create new amenities in that 2010-2012 timeframe. Um, Max, the one big difference here is that uh, Promontory is planned or it's entitled to have 1,600 homes, whether it ever gets there, you know, versus around 850 um, here. When we look at uh, just looking at the product specifically, you can also see a lot of similarities, both in terms of the sizes of homes. Um, obviously, there's some big differences there in terms of median listing uh, per foot, and then also in terms of the ratio between what they're capturing uh, versus what Cordillera is capturing. Tax rates are fairly close, 0.7% versus 0.9%, uh, but the HOA makes up for that. Uh, in terms of HOA is higher at Promontory than it is uh, here. So the cost of ownership is, is fairly similar in terms of the economics. The next piece we looked at is, well, you know, if the economics and the product and everything else is similar, you know, what's different between these two communities that might explain, uh, you know, why they're capturing a higher dollar per square foot. And we analyzed and looked at all of the amenities you know, from one community to the next. And you can kind of see here that, you know, Cordillera has 28% less golf club apps, 58% less athletic spa facilities. And this is in terms of square footage as a rough measure. So we're not even looking at the quality, just at the quantity. Um, pool beach house, you know, trailhead is a comparable size. It's actually uh, larger than the uh, beach house that they have at Promontory. Um, there are no family community or amenity buildings here uh, versus the shed at uh, Promontory, 14,000 square foot. Question centers are almost exactly the same. Uh, must have been the same architect or designer, uh, the plans. Uh, but total, when you look at the total built amenities, there's roughly 150,000 square foot of built amenities at Promontory versus 100,000 here. And that works out to 244 square feet of amenity versus 165 here at Cordillera. And I think, you know, important to note that there are more homes to be built at Promontory, but they're also expanding the amenities as they build more homes. So that ratio may go down. Um, but it won't just, the amenities continue to be expanded. There's a 14,000 square foot expansion underway of that Nicholas Golf Clubhouse right now. I think, you know, what's interesting is we took a look at the takeaway that there seemed to be a strong relationship here between home values and amenities in terms of those percentages that you can see um, in the last three columns. So one of our hypotheses here at Promontory is capturing and creating value relative to other communities in the Park City area based on the extensive amenity offering um, that it has. So we're not suggesting, and we'll get into some of the, the key takeaways and recommendations, um, but not necessarily suggesting that we should go out and copy Promontory, uh, but I think there is a learning there of looking at the relationship between amenities and what the market then values uh, the real estate for. So kind of summarizing you know, the research, and this is from our perspective as consultants, of uh, what we see as some of the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, and threats to Cordillera as a community. As we looked at the market analysis, we looked at the consumer research, looking at the owner survey, and looking at the benchmarking. And then we identified, and these are not necessarily in any particular order again, but you know, as we saw through the input, of certainly one of the key strengths of this community is the environment that you're in, both in terms of the quality of the natural environment, access to open space and trails, um, you know, this environment and what you're in here is 10 times uh, the quality of what owners of Promontory get to enjoy. And the uh, size and scale of a mountain community like this is unlikely to be replicated, uh, certainly in, in my lifetime, if ever. Of course, you have the world-class mountain golf experience um, and your proximity to Vail and Beaver Creek, you know, which we would look at as the two premier uh, ski resorts in the country. 
Um, and then you also have proximity um, uh, to the airport, which many communities do not. So that for us is kind of just summarizing what we saw is these are true competitive advantages for, for Cordillera. When it came down to the weaknesses of filtering through all of the issues and things that, that we heard, uh, you know, really there were three that we kind of highlighted. That one, uh, looking at regardless of the size of the amenities, um, more in terms of thinking about the quality of amenities, that there's a lack of fitness and spa facilities here, or the, or the facilities that exist are not commensurate or competitive with these other benchmark communities. And we're not, again, suggesting they should be the same size, but as we look at market trends and we look at the consumer research, you know, we saw that fitness and spa facilities are much more important to prospective buyers today than access to skiing and golf. And that likely was not the same if we were to be able to go back in time 20 years ago. Um, also, you know, we see there's a lack of family community amenities could be considered a weakness here versus what these other communities are doing, whether they're creating the family barn, creating the shed. But as we look at it, we're trying to capture that buyer that's in their 40s or early 50s that still has children living at home, as we saw through the consumer research. You know, they're looking for more family oriented um, experiences. Um, and then, of course, you know, we agree there's a lot lack of marketing here. There's a bunch of different ways to um, approach that and we'll get into that later. Um, but those for us were trying to separate what we saw as these should be things that we need to prioritize and address within the strategic plan. Um, in terms of opportunities, you know, I think there, there is an opportunity here of looking at how do we create more value that, you know, the values and everything I showed are remarkably consistent over time. Um, but when we compare and look at Cordillera versus these other mountain communities, um, and this is maybe not just a Cordillera uh, situation, but a Vail Valley wide of looking at, you know, why is Vail Valley real estate not selling or at the same pace or values as some of these other, other mountain communities? So is there an opportunity for Cordillera to be that place that starts to close that gap? What would it take for us to do that? And we'll get into some recommendations around that. Um, in terms of key, th key threats, there's really two um, that we identified. And again, not in a particular priority here, but one of that you know, there are very few buyers in that 65 plus, you know, that we talked about this going in, of could Cordy, you know, should Cordillera focus on that particular demographic segment, you know, more like the people that live here today, um, you know, but the market in that space in mountain communities um, is so thin that we don't see that as a viable strategic alternative. We have to look at how do we attract that buyer but that was the age when many of you bought here in this community in their 40s or 50s. Um, the second big thing here, I think that, you know, is that looking at, it's both an opportunity and a threat. One of the opportunities here is there's a significant amount of home sites that have not been developed. Uh, if we look across the Vail Valley that is mostly built out, there is more inventory or potential inventory here to create something than any other place um, in the Vail Valley. The threat that comes with that though is that replacement cost is higher than current values. So that's why we're not seeing many homes built or one of the our hypothesis around you know, spec builders are not coming and building houses because the cost to build is more um, than what the resale values are. So it's a very select number of people in those circumstances that are going to come in and build a home. So how do we approach this or you know, what should our priorities be? Uh, we met with, and these again are just in alphabetical order, and said really here's 14 different focus areas that we talked about with the strategic planning committee and the board. So going back to all of the different items that were inputted, and we really identified and asked them to prioritize and what came up with was a top, you know, top five priorities that should be addressed within the strategic plan. And that doesn't mean the other ones like short course or lodging or all these other things don't get addressed, but we said really we have to put our focus and solve for these things first, and then we'll fill in with strategies around those other items. Um, and the first priority was in terms of thinking about expansion, renovation, of athletic center, um, second was marketing, third was trailhead, knowing that improvements either need to be made there or a decision needs to be made imminently here in the next year or two. Um, fourth was around community enrichment, you know, in terms of activities, programming, communications, um, and the fifth priority was the creation of a, of a shuttle service. So what we wanted to then think about is, well, what are some of the development options specifically focused on those areas? And I'm going to share with you uh, and three strategic alternatives, and we'll talk through some of the pros and cons on, on each of these, and then we'll get into some uh, conclusions and discussions around these items. Uh, but we really saw and characterized these as one is to uh, improve on the existing amenities, and we'll go into some of that. 
that currently exist. And we sort of considered this uh, the, at the bare minimum, facilities like Trailhead and the Athletic Center um, need to be renovated and improved. Um, the second scenario we'll look at is how we might reorganize some of our amenities to better serve uh, market trends and the needs of future buyers based on consumer research. Um, and the third is around what we call consolidation of looking at a scenario of one of the unique things, issues slash opportunities here is the bifurcation of amenities between uh, the homeowners association and the club. And is there an opportunity or what could we do if we work together um, to create a better uh, amenity experience? So, and that one we call it consolidate. So I'll talk through you first, kind of the improve, and this is fairly simple. Um, you know, plans have already been put on the table over the last couple of years of looking at how to renovate the current athletic center um, and, and slightly expand it. Um, and also in the scenario of replacing the pool um, at Trailhead, largely leaving that facility as is, uh, but there's a need to, to replace the pool and plans and estimates have been uh, forwarded on that. So here we're really looking just at leaving the amenities, the experience, you know, largely as it is, uh, but with some improvements like adding spa uh, facilities, expanded fitness facility with at the athletic center, make, creating additional pickleball courts. There's plenty of land to work with there. Areas for spa treatment services, yoga, trying to capture um, and create more opportunities for wellness that we know resonates with prospective buyers today. So we saw some of the pros and cons of this scenario. Um, certainly the pros would be that you know, this requires of all the scenarios we're gonna look at the least capital investment. Um, it's also probably the quickest to implement because we're using existing facilities, plans have already been put forward, some estimates are in place, so these could be refined, um, but a lot of work has already been done that would uh, help in terms of implementing this scenario. And it would certainly help improve the fitness center experience, um, which we saw is, is quite important to prospective, prospective buyers. Uh, and some of the cons that we see with this particular scenario is that the quality of the amenities would improve, but the quantity of the amenities would largely remain remain the same. And that may or may not have as what we feel is unlikely to have an impact on, on home values. Also in this scenario, we're not really addressing that need uh, for more family oriented or amenity or community gathering space um, that we heard was an issue and we think is also important to prospective buyers. So those are kind of the pros and cons of, of that particular scenario. Um, the second scenario we looked at and said, well, what would we do if we were starting this community from scratch? And as we know, a lot of the amenities in the strategy were developed through, through the phases. If you were looking at this community holistically, you might've organized the amenities differently than the way they were created. So in this scenario, we looked at and said, Let, let's continue to renovate some, the athletic center um, at the summit as planned in the same as in the improved scenario, but instead of putting another uh, X million dollars into replacing the trailhead pool, um, could we go and create a new swim and fitness center uh, somewhere in and around the equestrian center area? Um, so that would provide an amenity in closer proximity to divide residents. It would also put the swim facility at a lower elevation. And um, it would also be an opportunity to create a more family oriented and a community um, gathering space. So getting all of the benefits that we talked about with the expansion of the, of the athletic center at the summit, um, but then creating a new, what we're calling a community ranch house, um, somewhere around the equestrian center lands. And I have just a little illustration of what that could look like. Um, this is another project that we've worked on uh, with outside of Seattle called Suncadium. It has a major hotel and lodge, major amenity center, um, but further down as the community expands, um, it's more than 10,000 acres uh, in the Nelson uh, Preserve of creating a specific amenity for those homeowners that were 15, 20 minutes away from the central clubhouse and the lodge. Um, and this was a rendering, it's actually just opened last year. Um, so it has a outdoor grill, community gathering area at the top, change rooms, uh, and a pool experience. So we're not suggesting we should copy and build this, but just looking at to give you a visual for what might this ranch house experience, what could it look like? Um, that's the pool, um, and this is the community outdoor pavilion, grab and go kind of a service, but it also hosts community barbecues and has become a really great community gathering space. So what are some of the pros and cons in this scenario? You know, I think you know, really you're really creating two amenity centers, one at the summit and, and one around the equestrian center. Uh, you know, was, yes, we're getting an improved fitness center facility and experience, uh, but in addition, 
to those improvements that we talked about with the improvement scenario, uh, we're also now creating this new family community oriented uh, uh, gathering place. Um, also creates an opportunity to create a fitness facility in closer proximity to divide residents. Um, and then it also creates an opportunity to potentially convert Trailhead into something else. And I'm going to share with you an idea on that uh, uh, in a moment. But I think, you know, from a marketing perspective, one of the other pros is also creates a new story to tell in terms of a new amenity, something to embrace as a more family oriented story. And the ranch house or whatever it ends up being called would be an expression of that family oriented multi generational experience um, that we're now offering at Cordillera. Um, so the cons in this scenario, you know, expect as we do the you know financial analysis on this, there could be some potential higher operating costs of not, you're managing two facilities. Um, and then there's obviously there's in this scenario we're thinking, expecting as we do the financials, we would probably expect that it would be it would be more capital required um, to do that, and it would obviously take more time to plan and implement. Uh, however, we'd be able to move on the athletic center sooner since more work has been done on that, and maybe something like the ranch house comes further down, further down the path. The third development scenario here we looked at um, is probably uh, the most comprehensive. Um, and in this scenario would involve closing Trailhead and the athletic center and partnering with the club to create an expanded amenity complex in and around here, here at the Mountain Clubhouse. Um, this, we could see the Mountain Clubhouse here now offering a, a new fitness center and a lap pool. I'm also offering a resort style pool outdoors uh, with one of the big advantages here of already having kitchen and dining services that you now have a pool experience that has food and beverage service. Um, looking at expanding uh, this particular space that would allow for larger community gatherings. Um, we could be offering spa treatment services, yoga, and also look at somewhere creating a small kids family barn. So you start to create a bit of a compound, uh, which is kind of similar to promontory in terms of combining golf house and family amenities all around one central parking area. Um, so no plans have been done to look at this. I mean, we've only kind of looked, you know, just roughly based on the available lands. Is this scenario possible? We think it is. More, more investigation would be required. Um, certainly some of the pros here, again, getting improved fitness center facility and experience, creating a new family community gathering place, creates a single destination uh, with indoor dining space for community events and gatherings so that now the community is all coming together in one specific space. Um, there's largely expected we would see as we look at the financials some operating efficiencies as you centralize all of the amenities and, and staff and services. Um, and then there's also the opportunity that to, the lands and trailhead or athletic center lands could be converted to other potential uses. Some of the cons of this one is we expect that this would be the most capital intensive scenario to execute. Um, also the logistics of working with the club, how does that partnership uh, manifest itself? We have a few ideas, um, but it's certainly the most complicated and complex um, to execute. Um, also an issue of just thinking about as we get through centralizing amenities, more homes getting built in the future, is there enough, enough parking here? You know, without analysis would have to be done to see and address to make sure that that, uh, that really is possible. So those are three pathways with respect to the amenities. Uh, two other things that we want think are important to include in the strategic plan. You know, one is the shuttle service. Um, and we look at the shuttle service as we think about this as a strategy, almost as much as a marketing strategy as it is an amenity. Um, that the messaging around a shuttle whether the pro well, however the proximity works out, you know, we would look at different costs around that, whether it's a few days a week or just on weekends, um, however that is, but it does create the message for fa more family oriented buyers or second homeowners that were connected to the skiing and to the mountain resorts. Um, and it also gives us a visual presence um, that you're starting to see a Cordillera shuttle out there. Um, so this is something that we think should be considered and looked at um, in the plan. I mean, the last piece is just around marketing. You know, we haven't got into the marketing strategy yet. You know, we think it's going to be important to define what development path are we taking so we know what our story is and who we should be targeting, and then we'll develop the tactics and programs to execute on that. Uh, but one idea within marketing that we have as you think about in the second scenario or the third scenario uh, would both, we would be not no longer using Trailhead as a swim facility. What could we do with that particular uh, facility? And we thought about the idea, we heard a lot about how within the lot, loss of the lodge, that we lost a place to introduce prospective new buyers to Cordillera, um, that there's no 
uh, or little short-term or little, no legal short-term accommodation here to be able to stay. Um, and also then thinking about how do we gender uh, PR, positive buzz for Cordillera. And we came up with this idea of thinking, I've been looking at glamping, uh, you know, which is one of the, the biggest trends in luxury travel today. Uh, we know that the economics of a hotel don't work as the, as the lodge proved out. And we don't think that that's a positive path to go to try and compete, compete with all of the bed base that's out there. But the idea of a seasonal glamping resort is something that could have legs. And again, this is not a money maker. Um, it's probably a cost neutral proposition, but it's actually a marketing strategy in terms of now, how do we get Cordillera into travel and leisure and common mast and the various uh, travel magazines. Uh, one example to kind of visualize what that might look like is uh, this is actually one of the most expensive hotels in the world. On the, uh, it's, you pay $4,000 a night to stay in one of these tents on uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, it was recently acquired by KSL Resorts, uh, who in partnership with Aspen owns Deer Valley and numerous other, numerous other steamboat and numerous other ski resorts uh, through Altera. Um, so they've actually looked at the financials around this and saw this as a very uh, lucrative business model that they want to create and expand. Um, this just gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, and then they have a central small little lodge building for the restaurant. So we could conceive of um, repurposing a trailhead in that building uh, with lamping around it as, an, as really more of a marketing strategy than anything else to bring affluent travelers into Cordillera in the summer season. So that's a blue sky thinking, uh, but just one of the ideas that we think about as we look at development options, what happens to some of these other facilities or, or lands if we were to make significant changes. So just to, to wrap up and then we'll get into questions of just kind of five sort of conclusions from our perspective at this point in the process. Uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the key issues here, uh, there is an opportunity, as I mentioned, in terms of the number of home sites that are available to build on. Uh, but the economics currently don't make sense um, and which is stifling the development of new home to, uh, which would help enhance uh, and potentially change uh, real estate values here over time um, the second is that you know we think you have incredible natural assets here but as we look at and study these other communities both here in the valley that the quality and quantity of the amenity offering here and the types of amenities is not necessarily well aligned with what current buyers are looking for and we think that that needs to be addressed to improve the attractiveness of, uh, of buying homes in the community. Um, third is that you know, we believe that you need to offer a more family-oriented program. Uh, so we have Camp Cordy and, and Trailhead, but that facility and the programming of it for families is, and multi-generational activities is relatively limited compared to some of these other communities that we're seeing that are being very successful in the marketplace. And for, you know, I talked about the, you know, just the opportunity of looking at, can we raise values here over time to get closer to the median area value that currently you're 80% of the median area value that a home in Edwards is actually on a per square foot basis is selling for the same or more. Um, so why are homes in an unamenitized area um, selling? And then I think it, you know, Mike touched on that, the need versus want. Um, so there is a need for housing, which is probably driving up some of those prices, but that's atypical in a master plan resort community with amenities. You know, we would expect it to be selling for more than, uh, and then getting values higher than what the primary residential real estate is getting. So you think just the difference of as if we could raise values, what does it cost to, to invest? And this just kind of illustrates, you know, if we were looking at aggregate value of homes in this community is around a billion dollars of 1% uh, increase in those values is, uh, 10.5 million, and if you go to 10%, it's 100 million. Uh, that we cannot say conclusively that if we invest X, it will generate this result, um, but we don't expect that things will change significantly other than rising with inflation if we do nothing. Um, so I think that for us is a, actually an economic opportunity here of looking at investing X will hopefully generate Y result and somewhere in the spectrum that exceeds the investment that's made. Um, you know, and lastly, I think we talk a lot, heard a lot about marketing. Um, we, from our perspective, think marketing is important, but it should only be put in place and a marketing strategy can only be developed once we've decided on a development path in terms of what we're investing in, how we're positioning this community, and then we're going to develop the appropriate marketing strategy. We think spending a bunch of money on marketing before that's done and knowing where you're going uh, would be money that would largely be wasted. Um, you know, and we do marketing and we're at creative services and do that for a lot of communities, 
Um, but in this particular case, you know, it's something that we would advise against until we have a clear vision, clear strategy, clear path, and then we'll know who we're going after to target it with those marketing initiatives. So that kind of just, this slide just summarizes those, those five conclusions. You know, lastly, in terms of our next steps are to share this presentation with uh, all of the owners uh, and put together a survey to get your input on some of these different development options and opportunities um, so that we can hopefully get down to a couple of preferred scenarios based on that response. Maybe it's all three we'll have to look at, but we would then put together a financial analysis around those. So what are the numbers that would go with each of these particular scenarios? And then we can share recommendations with you in coming back of looking at scenario A versus scenario B, what those costs and investments are, how that might be executed in more, in more detail. And then that would allow us to then hopefully choose one particular scenario and draft and finalize a strategic plan um, next year. So that's our presentation today. And I think we're gonna probably have lots of questions. I know we threw a lot of data at you. As I said, we're gonna make this presentation available um, so that you can all digest it and, and dig into it. Um, but we're excited at the opportunity here, the quality of what you have available. And you know, I think there is, is opportunity for, for Cordier, both in terms of enhancing quality of life and the experience, which is fantastic today. It can be even better. And uh, there can be some commensurate economic lift to that if those uh, if those investments are made over time. So thank you.